So, uh, hello everybody, my name is Matt Oswalt. Uh, I work for Juniper Networks, and I'm um, happy to talk to you today about a project that I've worked on. Um, it's uh, sort of focusing on a subject that's pretty near and dear to my heart. Uh, my goal today is to sort of let you guys behind the curtain with respect to some of the details of how it works and how you can get involved. Um, so, a specific tangible takeaway for this audience is, is um, you know, knowing how you can do that. So, um, I also have the, uh, in terms of responsibly starting on time, I also have the unfortunate, or rather fortunate, um, job of waking everybody up after lunch. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, and actually, I stopped by the gas station to price out some, some of these like trucker uh, energy pills, and I found that to be a little too expensive, so this will have to suffice. So, um, here's, here's the thing. And um, I, this is a subject that's pretty near and dear to my heart for a few reasons. Basically, we, uh, we have a situation here in networking. And for those that know my background, you know that my background is primarily engineering, so this might come a little bit of a, uh, of a shock. But I actually am in marketing now. I write code every day, don't assault me. But my job title includes marketing. And unfortunately, that means I have to invoke the power of Gardner every once in a while. Now, calm down, I'm not gonna go over more with this. Gardner had an interesting uh, statistic that they published last year. 82%, I want to let that sink in a little bit, 82% of data center network operations are done manually. Now, whatever, Gartner is what it is, let's just say this is like remotely close to accurate. I, I actually don't know how they got this data, they did some survey of some kind. But let's say this is like even remotely accurate. This should scare me. Um, it certainly scares me. I've been involved in network automation for a number of years. And um, to see a statistic like this, where 82% of data center network operations are still being done manually, and I mean, I mean device by device, CLI driven, you know, the whole shebang, basically the human being tying systems together by hand, uh, that's, that's kind of terrifying. And, and I, I do want to call your attention to one other interesting component to this report, is that this report is about data center network operations. This is not branch, this is not campus, which arguably is probably worse. This is data center. This is the crown jewel of network automation. This is where network automation should be highest. So even if you assume that 82% is even remotely close, or if you think it's off by like 10%, it's still horrible. So, if you agree that there is an adoption problem in automation, I think the case can be very easily made that there is. We need to change things up, because it's been about 10 years, and I think we've made a lot of progress, but uh, sort of what was talked about earlier, we've got this chasm moment coming up, and I think we need to sort of revitalize our efforts if we're gonna cross that chasm. So how do we do that? One way is to analyze what we've been doing. We've been focusing a lot on the technology aspect of, of networking and network automation. And in fact, this is true of all, all of IT. We're really good at that. We're really good at talking about the technology. And before you assume that I'm about to, to besmirch the engineer in all of us, and the engineer myself, not true. I think it's important. I think this is part of a paradigm that is, that is very important. You'll notice that the, that the technology aspect of this slide actually occupies about 80%, maybe 60%. So I'm not sliding that all the way to zero. I think it's very important that we understand the technical details of the solutions that we implement, that we do the homework. But one thing I think we haven't done a very good job at is focusing on people and focusing on skill sets. And I don't mean like, you know, training and like certifications and things like that. We've done that very well. One thing that we haven't done very well is arming people with the knowledge that isn't immediately or specifically applicable to a single situation. Rather, allowing them to feel empowered to compose solutions of their own. Now, of course, as we, as we go down this path, this becomes very difficult. As we all know, Automation is a very complicated subject. It's a very ambiguous word. This is not conducive to learning about automation. Inherently to the name and inherently to the subject matter, there's going to be different, uh, there's going to be different translations and different definitions of a lot of the things that we talk about. Even today, a lot of us are only in this room with different understandings and different definitions of what was discussed. It's the nature of the beast. So I think focusing on empowering people in a sort of vendor agnostic way, really even a technology agnostic way, not even just talking about networking, but just empowering people to think more like builders and, feel, and, and allow them to feel like they're included in the very clear revolution that's happening in computing today, rather than alienating. 
So I'll briefly talk about this. I won't go into too much detail because I actually have a session on this on Wednesday. So if you would like to hear more about this uh, subject, please feel free to attend that session. Um, I'm doing a talk with uh, a buddy of mine, uh, Michael Kehoe, who works at LinkedIn. His job is network reliability engineering, so he has a lot of uh, interesting perspectives to share. And I, I feel like, you know, at the risk of sort of inventing a new a new way of thinking about things. I actually don't think this is a, a new way of looking about things at all. I, I think network reliability engineering as a term is more about declaring something that we all already knew was true. And that is, automation is about doing things more reliable. If you listen to anything that was talked about this morning, you'll know that this is true. Every subject matter that was discussed this morning was about doing things um, in a more predictable and a more um, reliable way. So, six key behaviors that I think empower or uh, sort of uh, define the role of a network reliability engineer. If you would like to hear more about this, I think uh, we'll go into a lot more detail on Wednesday. I bring this up because a lot of what I'm about to show you is actually very heavily informed by this. But suffice it to say that NRE for me is about taking your existing skill sets, identifying that they actually very much matter in this new world, and then augmenting them with a new, a new purpose. There's a paradigm that, that I also have noticed um, over time. As I, as I teach people about automation, as I build, uh, help build tools, as I you know, work with customers, whatever it is. And I notice that there's, this, that there's this phenomenon that occurs along the path of learning a particular subject. Now, full stop, there will be a, a certain amount of time and energy that will be required to learn a subject. Certainly, if you want to put that subject or that tool or that technology or whatever it is into production, 100%. But that's not the only milestone in this journey. There are actually two milestones that you encounter along this journey. And the first one is, is very important for us to acknowledge and focus on. And I call that the milestone of, you know, this will be useful to me. No matter what, you're going to have to spend some time and energy learning something. At a certain point in that journey, you're going to come across this milestone where you're like, look, I know enough about this technology. I've kind of just been like winging it for now. But I've been able to see enough of this technology that I know that this is applicable to me. Or better yet, I know that it's not. The reason that's better is you're kind of done at that point. You don't have to spend any more time learning that subject because you know it doesn't apply to you, or at least doesn't apply for now. Unfortunately, because of the inherent ambiguity and difficulty around automation subjects, these two milestones are effectively adjacent. You almost have to learn exactly as much about a particular subject, just one subject, as is required to be able to have confidence into putting it in production. And I think we all know this, and I know that people outside this room who are less automation learned also know this. It's intuitive. So what's the reaction? I think the very natural human reaction is to do nothing, is to not even start down the path. If you know, and I think everybody does, that this giant red block exists, and you have to get there in order to figure out if you need to spend the rest of the time, you're just not going to start. It's not worth the risk. You know, the gambler's down the hall. I'm not one. So this is, this is important to me. My mission lately it has been to move the, second, uh, the first milestone back. Get to a point where we as an industry don't need to create experts just to inform them of where they need to spend their time. No doubt you have to be an expert or at least close to it to have confidence to put these things into production. I am not advocating for script kiddies here. What I'm advocating for is a reduction of barriers. So what I like to do is reduce this time investment minimum. So a little bit of an anecdote before I get into the actual meat of what I'm talking about. Anybody recognize this name? Cool. Anybody read the book Switch by Dan and Chip Heath? Highly, highly recommended. It is an amazing book. In that book, there's an anecdote that I think is extremely applicable to this conversation. And that anecdote, I'm going to probably butcher it, but I'll try to do my best. So in the early 90s, there was a pretty bad uh, childhood uh, malnutrition problem in, uh, in Vietnam. Uh, there's, there still is to a degree, but, but in the 90s, it was really bad. And uh, this guy, Jerry Sturdy, uh, was working for this organization called Save the Children. And uh, he, was a, he was sent into Vietnam to help fix this problem. Now his situation was a little bit dire. He, uh, he, had this, he, he had this weird position where, first off, he was not a nutritionist. He had no credentials in the area. Um, he actually didn't even have the support of the Vietnamese government. 
That's pretty close. He didn't even have the support of the Vietnamese government. They, they didn't like kick him out, but they weren't super enthused about his presence. Probably a PR thing, I'm guessing. What's worse is he didn't even speak to the Vietnamese. <laughs> Uh, he had no political power, he had no money, he had a few folks, a small team. So that kind of sucks. Sometimes it feels like what IT is like, right? Uh, sorry if I hit a little too close to home. <laughs> so Jerry Stern, he goes into this situation armed with very, very little, and he does one very simple thing. He tells his staff, all right, canvas the country all over the countryside, go from village to village and gather statistics. I want to know things like the, you know, the, 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 the yield of, of all of the farming that's being done there, a lot of, a lot of rice um, production there. I want to know the yield of, of, the, of the product. Um, I want to know the statistics of, uh, statistics of exactly how malnourished the population was, the, the children. Um, I want to know everything there is to know. So they came back to him a few weeks, months later, and uh, provided this data to him. And he noticed something very odd. Um, a small, fairly significant, but a small percentage of the villages, despite being incredibly poor, um, practically destitute, had very healthy children, very well-fed, nourished children. And he found this to be an interesting thing to pursue, so he went out to those villages and started observing their behavior. What he noticed was, uh, a few things, but one of the most important things he noticed um, is that as the as the as the village was gathering the, gathering uh, you know their their the, the food for you know for their crops, they would also gather some of the, the crabs and the um, and the and the, uh, the shrimp that was found in the rice paddies, and they would sort of put those into the into the rice dishes for their children, and providing them with badly needed uh, badly needed uh, protein. Now, of course, because we are humans, we like to simplify things. The conventional wisdom at the time was, well, those rural people are just stupid. They don't know how anything works. Um, blending, you know, bad sanitation, bad, you know, unclean water, you know, the whole, the whole you know, poverty, all the whole thing. The things that are easy to blame. And in the book Switch, they call that uh, uh, basically true but irrelevant. Meaning that, you know, those, knowing those things don't solve the problem. What, what Jerry discovered that he was really good at was identifying bright spots. He was uh, not an expert in anything that <laughs> he was sent there to tackle. He, was, he, he wasn't given a tremendous number of resources. What he knew was that there were some people that had success, and he knew how to get people to replicate that. And he even went one step further. He didn't just go from village to village telling people, well, stupid, all you gotta do is put shrimp in your rice and you're good. No, he actually, he actually started with the people that started this revolution in the first place, the people that, that, were, that were doing the right thing. And he empowered them to spread the word throughout the country. And there's been many studies uh, since then. I was actually just reading a paper a little bit ago that talks about how, um, how the, the malnutrition situation there has, has, has improved since then. That makes my mission pretty easy to understand. My mission, the thing that's close to my heart, is to get the success of the few in the hands of the many. Um, and many of those bright spots are here in this room. Some are not, but a lot are. And uh, I know that there's awesome automation stuff going on. I've known that for some time. And uh, it pains me to continue to go to customer environments and have them continue to uh, you know, hear for the first time things about um, Jinja templating and, and data formats and all these things. A lot of it's very new. And I like seeing them look on their face when they, when they discover these things for the first time. But I think, we, I think we need to spread the love. I think we need to get to a point where we as a community sort of come to a consensus on what automation means to us and empower, empower people to pursue it on their own. So to that end, one tangible thing that I've produced from this overarching sort of mission of mine is a platform called NRE Labs. So you can think of this as a website, but it really is a platform. First off, it's totally browser-based, meaning there's no sort of additional software that you need to install. Uh, it's just, you know, everything's in the browser. In fact, it's all on one page. Um, if you're trying to learn a particular subject, it's all on one page. The, uh, the second point is it's totally free. So there's no login, there's no paywall, there's no, you know, hidden trackers or anything like that. I actually got corrected on this because sometimes y'all can be a bunch of nerds. There is one cookie. Keeps track of who you are, not individually, 
which is so you can get back in your lesson if you refresh the page or something. Other than that, you know, we're not, we're not doing anything. And nobody looks at that data. It's just there for state. We also do Google Analytics. Sorry. Anyway, uh, nobody sees that information other than me. Vendor neutral. Um, it, and I, and I, I'm gonna just say that, and then I'll, I'll sort of prove it to you in the following slides. It's vendor neutral. The fourth point is uh, that it's open source. And I actually mean this in two ways. It's open source in the respect that actually kind of like everybody gets what that means, where they think, you know, you've created software that you put it on GitHub. Yes, that's true. Um, but there's other things too. We're building a lot of structure around this so that it makes it easier for people to contribute. And part of the, part of the way that we built the software was to include um, a type of abstraction that allows you to define a curriculum, you know, set of lessons or other learning materials as code. We actually call it curriculum as code. So effectively what you have is the software platform, which we've open sourced, but then the set of lessons that we show on the site, we also have in GitHub and we, we allow contributions to um, regularly. And, and, and in fact, we encourage that. So open source in, in many facets. So I'm gonna do some demos. First thing is to just show you the platform and, uh, you know, in action. Um, so there's a few things, I'm actually gonna show this one first. Um, so there's a few things that I think are important to call out. Uh, there is uh, a few things going on here, and uh, as I dive behind the scenes, you'll see sort of how we've done this. Um, you know, the, the role of the platform is to basically provide a set of primitives to allow you to show your content off in the best light. So when I show you this, sort of the, the final presentation layer here, don't assume that it always has to look like that. This is just the, the, you know, the things that I chose to highlight this particular content. But I built a lesson for Stackstorm, and uh, I think we mentioned that earlier, somebody else may be talking about Stackstorm, which is awesome. Uh, the Stackstorm lesson, it has like a myriad of things that you need to learn. You gotta learn the basics of how to interact with the CLI, that's just like a whole lab in itself. Um, you'll notice that in the top left, uh, there are these like chapters, um, we call them stages or sometimes labs, but basically these are like sort of natural progressions, natural segmentations of content. So everything in this lesson has to do with Stackstorm, but maybe you're teaching different things within Stackstorm, and we are. Uh, you know, so the basic concepts behind Stackstorm and how to use the CLI is step one. And then as you sort of succeed in, in uh, taking, that, uh, taking that lesson or that portion of the lesson, you can move on to the other concepts. Um, not every lesson has multiple, uh, multiple chapters or stages, but a lot of them do. Um, and it's really there to provide sort of natural segmentation. You know, our goal is effectively to keep the learning experience, um, you know, basically under five minutes uh, per lab. We don't, want, we don't want people to have to feel like they gotta invest like five hours just to get a little bit of experience. Which again is the goal here. We're not trying to create experts out of this, we're trying to bring the barrier down so that people can get their feet wet as quickly as possible. So, uh, and as, as you can kind of see, uh, we have a fully interactive CLI environment. So I'll just click SD2, uh, sorry, I clicked. Oh, there we go. And the keyboard's stuck. There we go. There we go. So SD2 version. So yeah, I mean, this is a fully interactive CLI environment. Um, it's, it's a Docker container. So it's, you know, anything you can run on Linux, you know, we make into the container. Uh, we, we provide basically images for everything that we try to teach, this one being Stackstorm. I actually have, a, I used to work for Stackstorm, so I kind of know how it works. What I did was I just took all of the different, there's like seven different services that you need to run Stackstorm. I just bludgeoned them together into one Docker container. Don't really recommend that for production, but that's not what this is. So that's cool. Other thing is, um, it's, not just, it's not just Linux tools. I mean, that's cool, we're all network engineers, right? We want to see a network CLI. We got that too. So in this particular lab, what we have is actually an interconnected topology of uh, Juno's VQFX devices. And they, uh, you know, they're connected in a given topology, and uh, they, they're actually pre-provisioned with the configuration that's necessary for this lesson. Um, part of the lesson uh, is aimed at illustrating the power, it's about Stackstorm, right? It's not about you know, Juno's or VQFX's or about even the network itself, it's about learning Stackstorm within a context of networking. So what we do is we prep the environment all behind the scenes, you don't have to do any of this, in configuration or in topology or none of it, it's all baked into the lesson definition. Um, where you basically say, like, look, here's your environment that you have to learn Stackstorm on top of, and it's just sort of like a vanilla example for network automation on top of Stackstorm. Let's instead focus on Stackstorm, you know, the thing we all came to learn. 
or substitute whatever topic you want. In a second, I'll show you napalm uh, or any number of things. The idea, here, the idea here is part of this, part of this time, the time investment minimum is about having to set up an environment to even begin to learn a thing. Right? You gotta learn, like 90% of the thing, 90% of your time spent is about setting up the environment to get to the point where you learn the thing you came to learn. And I find that to be unacceptable. So all of the, all of the, the way that we define the lessons on the back end and, and orchestrate them on the back end is so that when somebody loads this page, there's probably gonna be a little bit of loading time when things get provisioned, but it's totally hands off. They don't even have access to the, to the environment yet until it's provisioned. So you load this page and you immediately get to a place where you can learn the thing you came to learn because the environment's prepped for you. Um, another, uh, another thing that I want to call out before I go to the other lesson is um, we've all written, well, not all, but a lot of us have written blog posts on network automation topics. And um, one of the great things about blogging on these concepts is you can take code snippets, you know, little Python scripts or bash commands or whatever, and you can put them as, as sort of embedded snippets into your blog post. The cool thing about that is nobody needs to have, you don't need to be an expert to do, to do that kind of stuff. You know, you, you can, it, it doesn't require you to install anything on your laptop or to know the content in advance to be able to read a blog post. That's kind of the beauty of it. The trade-off being it's not very interactive. You kind of have to trust that the person who put the effort into creating the blog post, A, knows what they're talking about, and B, considered a sort of broad variety of user environments and skill sets so that it's easy enough to follow. Um, I know I myself have not always been that diligent, uh, and I know that that's a big problem. The, the cool thing about this particular environment is that you can kind of get the benefit of both sides of the coin, where you have something that's as easy to use as a blog post. You know, you didn't need to like, I didn't sign in at all. Um, this is the experience you get, exactly the same thing. There's no sign in at all. So you go to this page, you get this environment. Um, it's as easy to load as that, and you don't need to know anything because even the code snippets that are in here, there's a button underneath each one that just runs it for you. Now, that doesn't mean it's scripted, it's still a real environment. As you can see, I can run plain commands. I still have you know, control, but I also have guidance. And I think a lot of people learn this way, where you know, they want to see something done, but have the environment sort of sitting there, ready for them to sort of reverse engineer. I don't know anything about stacks, right? Click, 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 show me everything you have to show me, but leave the environment there fully interactive for me to, to poke at afterwards. I think a lot of people learn that way. I, I did, and I think a lot, of, a lot of folks in the room probably learn that way too. So I think that's very useful. So that's kind of cool. Um, another lesson that I want to bring up, uh, because again, you know, this, this, is, this is a platform. There's, there's primitives within this platform that enable you to build compelling content, um, but of your own definition. So my, my goal is to give you the color palette. You sort of make a painting from there as lesson contributors. Um, the other lesson I want to talk about is the introduction to uh, napalm. And there are a few uh, labs within this lesson. Um, in particular, uh, you'll notice that we have a slightly different lesson guide. Um, in the platform, you have the option to substitute the normal lesson guide, which is really just a markdown file. So in the, in the canonical example and in the previous lesson, what you saw was a, a simple markdown file you might find in like a GitHub repository. But what we do is we render it into HTML um, in real time on the platform. And that's how you get the, the JavaScript -y buttons kind of thing where you can click the snippet and, and learn the thing. Um, in this case, that, that Functionality is, is cool, but it's not enough. We need something a little deeper. We need an interactive Python interpreter within the actual lesson guide, because that context is extremely relevant. Jupyter Notebooks, naturally good fit for this. If you haven't ever seen Jupyter Notebooks, I highly advise this, that you look into them. One of the reasons why we implemented Jupyter Notebooks, the feature of using Jupyter Notebooks as the lesson guide, is because they're already used for things like this already. This isn't really a revolutionary idea, even within the network automation space. In fact, I know there are a lot of folks in the room. Um, Jeremy, I know, has, has a ton of Jupyter notebooks that focus on um, network automation. And, and, and I, it, it, was, it was a non-starter for me to build a platform that didn't somehow provide a way to reuse that content. Now, the benefit of running it in this platform is the Jupyter Notebook instance, the thing that actually runs this code, is actually co-resident with all of the network devices in the topology. And by the way, I didn't mention this before and I really should have, this topology is spun up on demand. It's, it's not a shared topology, it's not read-only, it's rewrite, totally spun up on demand for you. So when you're running this Jupyter Notebook, it's running commands that only, that only you are running. Like it's only, that's your, your context that you see here, is, it's, that's all you get. It's, nobody else has access to that. Same thing with the network devices. Like you can use you know, the built-in DNS functionality we have where you say like, look, I wanna change the config on VQFX1. The, the platform knows which VQFX1 you wanna look at. So you don't need to worry about IP addresses or host names. You just say, 
give me the facts from EQFX1. Done. And so that makes it, that's not as useful to like the lesson learners, but like for lesson contributors, not having to deal with like inventory and crap like that, you just refer to it by host name. I think mean, that's, 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 that's huge. So that's one, of the other, that's one of the reasons why we included this functionality to use Jupyter Notebooks, because it gives you sort of a, a, a very interactive, but yet still, at, you know, depending on how you build it, very human readable lesson guide. Um, and you still have the other tabs that you have. You still have like the, you know, the, the network device CLI um, or, or, a, or another Linux system. Like, again, my goal isn't to tell you what to have in your lessons, to give you choices. So that is, like the high level sort of um, tour of the NRE Labs uh, interface. And what I wanted to do, I think I have a slide on this. Yes, I do, good. Oh, actually, I still have this open, so let me go to the next slide. So let me tell you a little bit about how this works. Now, I'm hoping to end a little early so that there's time for this. Um, I don't know if uh, that will definitely happen, but it's flexible either way. I'll give you the, the, the high level first. Here's how the architecture kind of works. If you can think about the solution in sort of three phases, and again, all of this is open source. Um, what we've done is we've created a platform, starting with the middle, what we've done is we've created a platform that we call Antidote. And this, the idea behind Antidote is, again, to provide a set of primitives for showcasing network automation content, or frankly, any learning content. It's, it's pretty generic, but we're, that's our use case that we're focusing on. Now, there are two main components to this, and again, this is very high level. There's more, there's more detail behind the scenes, but these are the two main components. There's, of course, the web. I'm gonna go backwards, the red component is uh, Antidote Web. That's really just HTML, CSS, JavaScript, front end. That's really all that is. It's got a, a special library in there called Guacamole that allows you to do some of the terminal in the browser kind of stuff. And then we have some built-in logic for figuring out what tabs to present based on the lesson definition, all kinds of stuff like that. Now, in the back end, there's a service that we call Syringe. Um, and Syringe is really where the meat uh, of everything takes place. It's where uh, the lesson, the definitions of the, the curriculum are housed. Um, they're loaded uh, when Syringe starts. So from the file system, it, it loads all of the metadata from a given curriculum, and then it presents it via API to the front end. So the front end just simply consumes that API. So whatever curriculum is loaded into Syringe, the uh, Syringe service will offer via API, and then concordantly the Antidote Web uh, uh, presentation layer will represent. So there's nothing, there's no content baked into anything in the platform. It's really a, I don't want to say it's a pass-through because it does a lot of work, but the, the, the content itself lives elsewhere. Now that leads me into the curriculum phase up top. And my dinky little five milliwatt laser pointer isn't going to show up very well there. I have like a 500 milliwatt one, which I think is pretty, still pretty low by today's standards, but I really wish I'd have brought that. Uh, but it does blind you, so there's a small trade off. The, uh, NR, so if you can think of this, NRE Labs really is just the curriculum. So what we've done, like I said, we've open sourced the software, meaning uh, Syringe and Antidote Web. But what we've also done is we've open sourced the curriculum that you would feed into the platform. And we have that in GitHub as well, and you can contribute to it. And the cool thing about this is, like, we run this platform and we pay for the hosting, so it's kind of like free. You know, obviously you have to spend time creating the content, and I'm not glossing over that. That does require some time investment. But the benefit of this platform is it's kind of just a service that, that, that you know, we're, we're offering and that we want people to consume. So that's cool. Now, how does it actually run? So right now, it's running on top of uh, Google Cloud. Um, the, there's no tight integration there. Um, the main integration actually is with Kubernetes. So you can think of Kubernetes as the way that we provision resources. And if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, it's a you know, container scheduler. Basically, everything that we deploy, whether it's network devices or, or otherwise, we do inside of a Docker container. Kubernetes gives us that scheduling as well as other resources that we consume. So Syringe talks to Kubernetes to provision resources. Now, Kubernetes has to run somewhere. And right now, it's Google Cloud. Um, very soon, though, we're going to be migrating to a bare metal as a service provider for some crazy better performance because there have been some issues with that lately. So real quick, I do want to go over um, the last thing I said, which is that these lesson definitions are um, in GitHub. And I'm going to make this a little larger so you can see it. Um, the Stackstorm lesson that I showed earlier, this is the lesson definition for that. Now, there are other files in here. For instance, like if you want to configure your network devices, those go into a certain directory. But you can think of this as like the root of all of it. This is like the metadata file that describes the lesson. And then any supporting resources are sort of demanded by the central resource. And the tooling that sits behind this will sort of give you a clue as to what's needed. Like if you have a topology in here with like three VQFX devices and you forget one of the configs, it'll tell you. It won't load the lesson until you have the resources you need. Things like that. So on this page, you'll see that there's some like sort of, not boilerplate, but kind of boring, just metadata, things you might expect, like what category is this going to? That wasn't just me, right? 
but I hope this doesn't collapse. That was kind of scary. Uh, things you might expect. There's also a prerequisite. This is also pretty cool. Um, one of the things that we do is in, there's, a, there's an advisor functionality in the, in the portal. If I have time, I'll show you. But we're not just like leaving you guessing as to what to learn. Um, we have a tool. You know, I'm just going to show you. It's easy enough to show. So I, you notice that in that YAML file, there was a list of prerequisites. The reason, we, the reason that's important, it's an optional field, but it's very valuable to use this because what we do is we actually build a dependency graph behind the scenes of what lessons relate to each other. So, for instance, if you start with something really low level or fundamental like YAML, um, you don't really need to know anything in advance of that. Uh, at least there's no lesson that kind of precedes that. You could argue that there are some things you could learn before you learn YAML, but um, for us in the curriculum right now, there's, there's no sort of preceding content. That's one of those fundamental skills that we teach. However, there's a ton of tools and, and other lessons that do require that you know YAML ahead of time, Ansible being a, a very popular example. So if you go into this environment where you're like, look, I don't, I don't know what the tools are, or what the te te techniques or fundamentals that I need to learn, I just know what I need to do. So let's say like unit testing. Um, or let's actually, a better example, somebody mentioned compliance. So in the federal space, in the DOD, there's this thing called the STIG, where you have to make sure that all of your devices adhere to the STIG for that vendor. Incredibly time consuming an amazing use case for automation. So automated STIG compliance validation is one of the lessons that we built. Now you notice that I just typed STIG, that's all I did, it had a drop down, I clicked it, and here I am. Now it didn't take me to a lesson. What it did was it built the dependency graph behind the scenes based off of the metadata for every lesson in the platform that's been loaded in the platform. And it tells you what kind of things you should probably know ahead of time. Now this is way down the path, so normally you wouldn't get subjected to all of these dependencies. This is kind of, this is a very uh, specific to a use case, so there's a lot of potential things that you might want to know ahead of time. But you can tell the platform sort of like where you are with some of these things. Um, and what it'll do is it'll curate sort of a curriculum based off of what you think your strengths are. And so it tells you what all those dependencies are. Now again, this is not baked into the web UI. This is, this is dynamically built based off of the metadata provided by each and every lesson author. So as an author, if you're building content within the curriculum, what you do is you're like, look, I know this tool really well, and I know that it's probably a good idea if you know these same things ahead of time. You don't need to worry about the rest of the tree. We'll build that for you. Just talk about the things that you think people should know ahead of time. And then, of course, we build the tooling for the user so that they can figure out how to navigate through that. Uh, back to, how much time? 15 minutes, okay. Okay, I'm gonna get through this real quick because I think this is probably the most important technical part. So the goal is to greatly reduce that time investment minimum. Remember the graph? I'm being religious about reducing that first milestone and shrinking it. So here's how I think we get there. Th sort of three things. We run, like I mentioned, this might kind of sound weird, but it's actually not. It's actually, actually kind of straightforward. What we do is we actually run our network devices within Quimo, which is just a, a, a high, simple hypervisor, um, within Docker. So if you aren't familiar with Docker, Docker is just a packaging format with, a, with an entry point. That's all it is. It's like a tarball with an entry point. It's a set of files, a file system, if you will, with a thing that you point to to say, run this command when you start. That's all it is. And the thing that we start is Quimu. So whenever the container starts up, it has all of the dependencies already built into the container. But then the first thing that it runs is Quimu. So it's basically just a virtual machine with a thin Docker wrapper around it. Makes sense? And we don't need redundancy. We don't need most of the features that most people are accustomed to in things like VMware. We just need it to run. And so for that, in that respect, it's actually working really well. Um, and I'm totally going into the too much detail for this high-level slide. The next thing is this fully web-based presentation layer. I've, I've talked about that, so I, I think that's kind of obvious at this point. But I'll go into some of the details and how that works and what you can use uh, there. And then the third thing is automated configuration and prep for the environment. This is huge. Um, again, you know, the, the people that are learning the subjects and the content that, that we in this room are putting out aren't stupid. They know that this is a complicated area to get into. They know it's seemingly orthogonal to everything that they've been learning for the past decades. Um, and uh, I think if we can make it so that they don't have to boil the ocean just to get started, this room is going to get bigger fast. And I think that's everybody's goal. It certainly is mine. So um, I, I think reducing the time investment minimum is, is the ultimate goal. And I think that third thing, I mean, they all work together, but I think that third thing is big because what we're doing is we're not taking this stance of like, thou must be a BGP expert in, the, in order to write five lines of Python. Like, no, I would expect that people in this room know how to do that, yes, but it's not the point. The point is to learn the thing that we, that we came to learn. I don't care if you know the other things in advance. That's kind of up to you. So let's go into detail on these three things. 
how do we run those dang network devices in Docker? So this was originally inspired by VRNet Lab. I have a note in there to make sure that's the right name and I need to take out because it is the right name. Um, again, I'm blanking on the actual human name of the person that created that project. Anyone want to help me out there? I want to give credit. It's not my project. Is it louder? Christian Larson, thank you, yeah, yeah, that is his project. So Christian Larson actually did amazing work. Um, it's called VRNet Lab, uh, it's published um, on GitHub. And basically what he did was he created a set of sort of very, um, very structured and repeatable ways of building Docker containers out of raw network, you know, virtual disk images. And we, we actually started using that. Um, what we've done since then, because we have been trying to figure out some of the nuances of what we're trying to build uh, around the platform side, is we actually deviate a little bit from that. We're kind of doing our own thing right now. But the intention is to come back to either that or some other structured, repeatable way of bringing other network device images into the platform. Um, so I just want to say that up front. The second thing, uh, basically what we do is we package these images straight into Docker. So we have a Docker image that represents a network device. It's basically a VM, but it, you know, it's executable by Docker. And the Kubelet, which is the component of Kubernetes that runs these containers, it's executed by that Kubelet wherever the scheduler says you need to run. So we have like a, a set of three big ass VMs, and the, the, the Kubernetes API server says, you know, server two is a little underutilized. You're trying to ask me to spin up a new lesson, start it up there. And it kind of tries to keep things even out. If you're familiar with VMware DRS, you can kind of think of it as a proactive DRS. So the third thing is, um, any vendor, this is important, very important, any vendor at all, any image whatsoever is feasible because again, the, the interface here is extremely simple. It needs to run in a VM and talk on a port, right? I don't care what API it has, because that doesn't matter. Um, it, it does in, in respect to the configuration abilities that I'll talk to in a second, but as you'll see, we support anything. Um, so it, it actually doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, the, the, there's, no, there's no opinion on this layer so be very clear here, there's no opinion whatsoever on this layer as to what type of device fits in here. It doesn't even need to be a network operating system, frankly. In fact, one of the things that we're using this, this platform for is to teach things like Docker. And you can't really do that if you're running it in Docker containers, because then you get into weird crap. So what we've done is we've just created a, an Ubuntu virtual machine and then given that you know, lesson author root access to that. Who cares? So it's a very agnostic interface. And so I encourage you to think of this as, as a place where we can prove out kind of Generic interface. All right, moving on to the second thing. Flexible presentation layer. Y'all have a bunch of awesome content. I'm gonna give you the tools to show it in the light you think is appropriate. So my job is not to be opinionated here, it's to give you a set of options. Now, I'm gonna actually start from right to left because I kind of already talked about this. In terms of showing off the, the actual like learning content, meaning human words, telling the users what they need to click and what they need to type and all that kind of stuff, you have two options there and I kind of talked about it. You have a markdown file, and it's just straight vanilla markdown. The only exception to that is a small HTML snippet that you put underneath. You know, if you have like a, a piece of a chunk of code, you just put this like pasted like thing underneath that and it gives you the button in the front end. That's it, but it's vanilla markdown. So if you're familiar with markdown, that's, that's all it is. The other thing is uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Now again, as I mentioned, it has full access at runtime to everything else in your environment. So you can actually have your notebook run commands against the other endpoints that are in your environment, things like routes and switches or other applications, it doesn't really matter. When we say endpoints, we, we just mean things that are running in your lesson. So that's sort of what I talk about on the left. Uh, when I talk about endpoints, I just mean things that are running in your lesson. These could be network devices, these could be applications, servers, these could be just a small Linux container running BusyBox so you get a shell. Doesn't matter at all. These endpoints are defined in your lesson definition, the sort of YAML file that I showed you earlier and you can specify if you want some sort of net, uh, special network connectivity, but they're all connected to the same management network by default anyway, so even if you didn't want to define that, they can all talk to each other. Now you have three options here. Uh, the obvious option is SSH. We have a terminal in the browser, and that's sort of the most commonly used one. We also have the ability to embed an iframe. If your container is running a web application, let's say you have a piece of software that has a web front end, um, and you want to be able to show that in your lesson without sending the user elsewhere, so you can actually have it in a tab, just like the other sort of terminals. That's an option for you too. Um, uh, we don't show that off a lot just yet because the original use case for this actually was showing Jupyter books. That's actually how we're doing that. Um, so what we're doing is we're just making that much more generic, so you can use it for other stuff too, kind of whatever you want. And then the third thing, this actually came up on our, our one of our community channels. Um, it'd be awesome if we could have VNC because not everything runs in a terminal or in a web browser. So, uh, some things like Wireshark, you know, you can run that with an, you know, an X server environment. It'd be great if you could execute that in a container and then give visual access to that as if it were a desktop. 
Uh, so we're going to do that. That's, that's something we want to do. And if it's not clear, all of this comes up to the learner's browser so that the learner doesn't have to worry about any of this. This is all on the mind of the lesson contributor. Again, my goal is to give you tools. You know your content. I want you to be aware of the options that I've created to allow you to highlight your content in the best light. And the third thing, again, very important, that we prep the environment so that the person, when they arrive at the, at the, at the platform, that they're learning the thing they came to learn and nothing else. And um, I just want to reiterate, I think that's important because you know, we, we, we like to sort of take this stance that, you know, oh, you, you can't just come to, you know, you can't just, like, learn, um, you know, the, the, the really, like, little if intro steps of something and then, you know, you're just creating a bunch of script kitties. Well, you know, everybody was a script kitty at some point. So this is about getting them on the journey and not excluding them from it. And for me, the way that we do that is prepping the environment and being a lot less opinionated of what they need to do in order to get into this sort of learning journey. If you came to learn Ansible, it doesn't matter if Ansible's job is to go look for BGP relationships on your routers. That's not the subject. The subject is Ansible. So prep the environment to have the BGP relationships that are needed for the lesson ahead of time, and don't let the user worry about that. Even if they should be network engineers that know that kind of stuff, it doesn't matter. It's orthogonal. And the way that we do this is pretty simple. We actually have a, a Docker image that we maintain, that we make available. Uh, well, it's public, but it's really only useful in this platform. Uh, where basically it has, or at least soon will have, you'll see it runs Napalm today, so it's a, a multi-vendor network automation library, supports a wide variety of vendors, but not all of them, and it also doesn't uh, support the ability to configure things like, you know, your, your Linux endpoints. Uh, it's kind of a network device kind of centric thing. So very soon we're gonna throw the whole toolbox into that container and allow you to configure any endpoint, um, whether it's a network device or not. Again, the goal is to pre-configure everything. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is collections. This might only be interesting to a few of you, but I think it's an important thing to highlight because one thing that we've had is, as people contribute to the platform, or to the curriculum, rather, we've noticed that they, um, that we, that some of them work for companies, um, uh, consulting companies sometimes, even like companies like Network to Code. Uh, and what we would like to do is have homes for that and allow people to get credit for, for, for putting in that effort. And so to that end, we've created um, something called collections. Now, uh, this is our test site. I just want to—I want to reiterate that none of these, uh, or at least not all of these companies, have committed to like contributing. I just put these up as an example. Um, so just FYI, um, I just this is a mock. Um, and actually, did I? I did. It's a little bit of sucking up. So there's this uh, Network to Code collection that uh, Network to Code. Uh, you know, when you know when 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 a company like Network to Code considers, you know, contributing content. As, as other as other as other uh, contributors might, um, it would be nice if they could have one place to send people that allowed them to say like, look, this is what we've done in the open. This is what makes us awesome. Here's why you should follow up with us. Um, certainly, we all have those avenues today. But what what I'm going to do is provide one within this platform. If you do decide to contribute content to this, I want to make sure that people understand where it came from, understand um, where to get more. Um, and so what we'll do is, um, and it's actually really easy to do this, you define the collection once. Again, all of this is in GitHub, this is the beauty of it. None of this is baked in the platform. It's all in the curriculum. It's all loaded dynamically at runtime. And when you create a lesson, all you have to do is tag it. Like, I, I, work, for, I work for Juniper, and we actually have a Juniper collection, so it's really simple for me when I create a lesson. If it happens to do with Juniper stuff, not all of the lessons I create are, are Juniper-focused. In fact, most of them aren't. Um, but when it is Juniper-focused, what I'll do is I'll tag it with the ID for this collection and all of the mapping will just take place. It's just a one line kind of thing. Collection equals one. So this is pretty cool. Next thing, I think I just tried to nap two advanced slides. I didn't have any slides. Um, but that's okay, I'm pretty much done anyway. I wanna throw this uh, slide up so that you know where to go. And I'll break for questions for the last minute. Basically, uh, these are the things that you wanna know about. Uh, the lab site is labs.networkreliability.engineering. If you want to join our community forums, it's the second URL there. And then we have other things like the open source organization, which is NRE-learning. And then, of course, we've got you know, docs for the platform. If you want to learn about how to put lessons together, um, you can go to the docs. But we also are very hands-on. That's one of our, it's really our only focus right now. In fact, there's a load of actual work that I'm ignoring right now to help maintain this project, um, which currently my employer supports, but that's the situation. Anyway, uh, short of that, follow us on Twitter uh, for updates, things like that. We're constantly pushing either content or platform fixes or whatever. It is a very new project, so just be aware of that. Um, and, uh, and, and, and just as a call to action, I, I love the work that's done by this community, and I would love to uh, be able to amplify it. So let me know how I can help you. Thank you.